Ukrainian civilians under massive fire. Russia has significantly increased the number of attacks on the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. The number of air raids went from a few per week last month to several per day. Nevertheless, good afternoon. This is Henry Kino on UATV channel, giving you a hard truth in easy terms directly from Ukraine. Sometimes the truth is unbearable, so much that you just can't accept it. For example, I can imagine how hard it is for an average Russian who thinks he or she has done nothing to instigate Russia's criminal aggression against Ukraine to accept the bare fact it is either by their direct action or by means of indirect, nonetheless not less criminal, in action, Putin has usurped power and started his criminal war against Ukraine. And the whole nation are partners in crime. It is not just Putin. The Russian nation voluntarily or not sends them mass missiles into Ukrainian cities at night. I live in Kyiv. Fragments of drones and missiles are literally falling onto my house and other houses in Kyiv, killing and wounding us. While you are watching this, remember, people die here in Ukraine every day, being murdered by Vladimir Putin's delusional, outdated imperial ambitions and his army of brutes, and a silent blessing of entire Russian nation. And Russia has recently increased its drone and missile attacks on peaceful Ukrainian cities. At night, of course, not sure if Putin thinks that American Patriot air defense systems are unable to detect incomings at night or something else. However, our air defense has already proven to be the best in the world. Such yourself. Here is what has been going on recently in main Kiev. Russia has launched 185 missiles, 154 were downed. 381 drones were launched against 342 downed. However, as sad as it is, on May 26, four people were killed and 32 others injured in varying degrees of severity as a result of a Russian strike on a hospital in Dnipro. The reason for Russia's increasing number of attacks on us is quite obvious. Putin is pissed off. He says that he's losing the war in the battlefield and has resorted to a terrorizing civilians. More terror, as Putin hopes, will make him win. Constant barrages of drones and missiles over our heads every day. That is Putin's desperate plan to reclaim the initiative by means of terror. This is a dire situation in you, dear world, can be of great help. Best what you can do is not to get used to what is going on. Do not get used to Ukrainians getting murdered by Russia. Russia's attacks, no matter how frequent they are, and a week or seven per day cannot and should not be considered a norm. It's nothing else but a war crime that can and must and will be stopped by strengthening Ukrainians' army in general and air defense in particular, including them F-16s coming soon, and defeating Russian aggression as such. Russia pursues obvious goals by means of terror to put more psychological pressure onto civilians. These night air raids are aimed at depleting Ukrainian air defense ammunition stock as much as possible. And one and only response to that is possible just as well increased production and supply of air defense systems and ammunition by our EU and NATO partners. And this is exactly what President Zelensky's entire diplomatic team is working on. We will defeat Russia and its terroristic approach by the means of tactics and strategy of working together with our partners. Firstly, subject to progress in the field of UAVs and the availability of X-16s. Secondly, subject to the saturation of Ukrainian defense with advanced Western air defense systems. All this, and it is already happening right now, will inevitably create a situation where it will be absolutely pointless for Russia to endure all these sanctions and restrictions and battlefield losses just as well without being able to actually change something by military means. And then the Kremlin will be left with last resort in the argument. Go in nuclear. However, it is practically inapplicable in real conditions and is rather nothing but a mean of blackmail than a relevant threat. You see, Putin's blackmail just doesn't work because nobody trusts Putin anymore. No country in the world, even those to say they do for Kremlin's money, of course, in reality don't. Therefore, the very moment Putin says he's not going nuclear... We have not gone crazy. We are aware of what nuclear weapons are. We have this means, and they are in a more advanced and modern form than any other nuclear country. It is obvious. But we are not going to blandish this weapon like a razor running around the world. But of course we proceed from the fact that it exists. This is a natural deterrent, not provocative to the expansion of the conflict 
but a deterrent. I hope everyone understands this. The world immediately starts to get ready right to the opposite. It would certainly be another example of President Putin's brutality if he were to use a so-called dirty bomb. There would be consequences for Russia whether it uses a dirty bomb or a nuclear bomb. We've been very clear about that. Ned Price, U.S. State Department spokesperson. That is what the Kremlin always does, you see, acting to the opposite to what it says. So just in case it is the case, and if the hatches of the missile silos in Russia open to release their Russian God-blessed Satan missile and other nuclear wickedness, the world answer will be as righteously swift and devastating for Russia just as it should be. The survivors would probably need a new map of the world, where Russia has shrunk in terms of size to smaller than my native Latvia's and in terms of geopolitical influence less than fictional Narnia. But if there is someone who, by all means, is not ready for Putin going nuclear, it is his inner circle, his closest allies. I mean, where else the offsprings of Russian oligarchs to spend their stolen billions, if not in Europe and America? In nuclear fallout-free Siberia? I sincerely doubt that. We would rather most likely see Putin die of some unknown virus or fall out of his Kremlin's office window like six times, just to be sure. This way or the other, without the highly unlikely option of going nuclear, Russia, in order to achieve some relief in sanctions and international pressure and battlefield losses, will have to retreat. Everyone who knows how to count to ten can see that. And this is partly why all these international war dealers are so busy at the moment with their peace reconciliation and negotiations, all that Western fatigue theme and etc, etc, etc. What is clear at the moment, as soon as Western advanced air defense systems and aircraft will be delivered to Ukraine, the faster the military arguments alignment will become so very different, levels up for Ukraine and the world. As Ukraine Forum reports, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken announced this on June 1st in the capital of Norway, Oslo, during an informal meeting of foreign ministers of allied countries. Regarding Ukraine, in view of the ongoing discussions today, the first thing I want to say is that in Vilnius, when the leaders meet at the summit, our friends from Ukraine can expect a powerful package of both political and practical assistance. Antony Blinken, United States Secretary of State. If it is still not clear to anyone in the world why advanced Western weapons should come to Ukraine ASAP, I would love to explain it by means of a short story happened at 1st of June 2023 on the International Children's Day. This is not a special story. Very sad, but not special. Stories like that happen here in Ukraine every day. Here it is. This is a photo of a grandfather who has just lost them both, his daughter and his granddaughter during a Russian missile attack on Kiev on 1st of June 2023. On the International Children's Day, Russia has murdered two children in Kiev. Now, this is how Russia treats Ukrainian children in reality, whatever it is saying on its Kremlin TV. I mean, we in Ukraine always knew it won't be easy. There will be casualties. And we must endure until all the promised and so long anticipated advanced weapons arrive here in Ukraine. And we will endure. And then we will win for the sake of all of us, for our collective good. Just do us a favor. When time comes, dear world, don't forget who started all that and what Russia is in reality. Because we in Ukraine won't, ever. Let me take you to Oslo, where the informal meeting of foreign ministers of allied countries was held and tell you more on what it was all about. Norway is only the second country to host a NATO meeting of an informal nature. Jens Stoltenberg was presiding. The details, how this will be done, uh, uh, what kind of mechanisms, that remains to be decided. But the idea of preventing uh, history from uh, repeating itself, uh, preventing President Putin uh, from continue to be able to chip away at European security, that's the aim. And then we discuss the means to, to achieve that. The ministers met in a very small and confidential setting. Instead of pre-structured program, the plan is to enable a more open, direct and interactive exchange. In concrete terms, this means that only ministers will be in the room without their advisors. No prepared statements will be read and no prepared speeches spoken. Instead, ministers will engage in discourse and discussions and have a genuine debate. 
I am pleased that Norway has taken out the baton of this still young tradition of conducting an informal meeting of NATO foreign minister, which Germany established only last year. Like at least year's meeting in Berlin, our task in Oslo will be to prepare for the upcoming NATO summit of the heads of state and government by getting an overview of the current security policy situation and jointly addressing the core strategic issues facing the North Atlantic Alliance. Annalena Bayerbock, Foreign Minister of Germany. Topics to be addressed at the meeting are drawing the relevant conclusions from the war of aggression against Ukraine. The main focus on the discussions of NATO ministers of foreign affairs will be preparing for the Vilnius summit in early July. One key topic will further development of NATO's partnership with Ukraine. Ministers will also look at how to continue supporting Ukraine's defensive efforts and its fight for peace against Russia's attack, which has lasted for more than 450 days so far. Another issue will be what conclusions NATO must draw for its own security from Russia's aggressive conduct. NATO is the key pillar for Euro-Atlantic security. That is why, in Oslo, we will also talk about how we can resolutely strengthen NATO's capabilities for defence and deterrence. Not only for today and tomorrow, but for the coming years, so that people everywhere in our alliance can enjoy security, the Foreign Minister Bobak said ahead of the meeting. In this connection, ministers will discuss reaffirming what is known as the Defence Investment Pledge, as well as how to strengthen the resilience of critical infrastructure in the alliance. This includes, for example, critical undersea infrastructure. There is one more issue, actually. There is quite a little time to obtain ratification so that Sweden can join the alliance prior to the Vilnius summit in early July. Hungary has repeatedly declared that it will ratify before Turkey does, as soon as the required steps have been taken there. Now that Turkey's new parliament has been formed, there is an opportunity to swiftly bring before it a motion to ratify Sweden's succession to NATO. And just let's see what happens. And if we would be looking while we are looking attentively enough, we might see the obvious. The future of the Euro-Atlantic community is being decided on Ukraine's front line. Ukrainians have proven to be a brave, resilient and powerful nation in the face of full-fledged Russian aggression. As a NATO member, Ukraine will significantly strengthen the security of the entire Euro-Atlantic community. We actively work together with our closest NATO partners to forge a like consensus on three critical issues. Strengthen institutional Ukraine-NATO ties, a step towards Ukraine's membership and security guaranteed. Ukraine expects NATO allies to take a strong step towards Ukraine's membership at the NATO summit in Vilnius and develop a clear and comprehensive algorithm for our country joining the alliance. Russia is attempting to demolish the very foundations of the post-World War II security construct. This is why the stakes for the entire Euro-Atlantic community are so high. We all need a strong alliance capable of maintaining peace and stability in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Ukraine's accession into such an alliance will help achieve the objective of long-term strategic stability and security. And the summit in Vilnius provides an excellent chance for allies to take a proper action. It's time to put double thinking to an end and accept the objective reality NATO needs Ukraine just as much as Ukraine needs NATO. Is Ukraine's peace formula the only realistic path to peace? Let us see. No other country in the world craves for peace more than Ukraine. It's just that little thing. We in Ukraine want that peace to be true and not a jeopardy. A respite, which Russia will no doubt use in order to regain forces and start a new offensive against Ukraine. Zelensky's 10-point peace formula urges the world to achieving just and sustainable peace in Ukraine, Europe and around the globe. It covers 10 areas where Russia shattered peace and global security. The formula provides every nation with a unique opportunity to take the lead on any item of preference within the formula, without obligations on other items. In simple terms, do what you can today in your country for global peace tomorrow. What could be more comprehensive and simple? And we in Ukraine do have every right to say we are right, as we're spilling our own blood during this war, and that rightfully puts us in the center of any peacemaking effort, isn't it not? So the countries and politicians of the world gather around Ukraine to hear out what Ukraine as a country at war has to say about peace. And that is exactly what Zelensky does as the president. 
Ukraine calls for all peace-loving countries who want peace and want to defend the principles of the UN Charter to actively join us in the implementation of the peace formula. All the parts of it are supported by relevant UN General Assembly resolutions and are fully compliant with international law and the UN Charter. Ukraine sees a variety of peace efforts taken by foreign leaders in countries not too successful sometimes, like, for example, urging Ukraine to reconcile with Russia and letting it have a piece of our land forever in return for a short-term respite. My question to these politicians is always the same. Would you give up on your own lands in favour of a brutal aggressor? Would you reconcile with your occupier? Would you negotiate with a thug who murdered your family, raped your wife and abducted your children? Well, suit yourself if you would. We won't. So, save your breath and join the real peace formula by Volodymyr Zelensky. As Ukrainian's peace formula remains the only realistic way to achieve a just and lasting peace in Ukraine, and as so for the whole Europe, we invite every nation to join our efforts in putting it into action. It is a minute of more on UATV, Minute of Righteous Explanation. But first of all, let me thank you guys. You were asking, where's Henry Keen? And it warms my heart. Here I am. As a bearer of a European passport, I was using a lucky opportunity to visit my German parts of the family once here since I came to Ukraine and was here ever since the first weeks of the war broke out. But here I am back answering your question, guys. The question I picked to answer today is a question by user Jean-Claude Jr. Do pro-Russian people pose a threat to NATO, European Union, Switzerland, Japan, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea and Bosnia? Let us first be sure that we are using one and the same terminology here. Pro-Russian-minded Russians today mean pro-Putin Russians. And pro-Putin Russians, whether living in Europe or in any of the countries that you, Jean-Claude Jr., have listed, are nothing else but a neoplasm inside the body of the host country. Putinism is a cancerous tumour spreading metastases of Kremlin's propaganda, imperial arrogance, justification of political and physical oppression against anyone who opposes its dreadful violent paradigm. Moreover, demanding an absolution for it, since they claim to be the carriers of great Russian culture and that absolutely religious faith in Kremlin's propaganda and Putin's holy right to whatever he pleases. To fake democratic elections, for example, to change the constitution to satisfy his tyric needs, to start wars without being able to end them, to destroy every liberty and freedom because any liberty and freedom poses a direct threat to the Kremlin. That is... Everything that the historian and political scientist and the world's leading expert on Russia, Timothy Snyder, calls it Russism. Russism is a modern form of fascism. So in fact, dear Jean-Claude, what you're asking me is if fascism is posing any threat. And the user lookup is right here to answer you, saying no, Russia does not pose any threat to those countries, but only to Ukraine. Well, the user lookup is right, you see. Russian fascism does not pose any threat to New Zealand or Japan or Australia since the distance between Russia and these countries is the only thing that is not letting Russia to pose such a threat. If you are far away from Russia and there are not many pro-Russian fascists living in your country, you are just fine. However, if, God forbid, it is not the case and Russia is your neighbour, then this is what is going to happen. Ну такі спокійні, я не знаю. От ви як? Психологічно. Психологічно. This footage was done by my colleagues near the very front line. That is what the war looks like. And that is exactly what Russia will bring to your doorstep if led to. So, suit yourself, dear UATV subscribers, if that poses a threat to your country, wherever you live. Suit yourself whether to call an aggressive war an aggressive war or use Putin's lingo and call it a special military operation. Suit yourself if those threats to the great Russian language and culture are true or just a pretext used by the Kremlin to draw blood and justify terror and genocide wherever Russia comes. Such yourself, if to call Russian occupation and terror a liberation. Such yourself, but be careful. 
Whatever you are going to call things, things are going to become for you. So it is better to look at the facts here in Ukraine as a clear and obvious example. Ukraine is telling you that Putin is a maniacal dictator on his never-ending quest for power, and it was, is, and always will be the case just as well, since the dictators just do not change. Ukraine is telling you that Russia does pose a threat to any country in the world which is trying to exercise democracy as a main societal future. Ukraine is telling you that pro-Putin fascists and their oil-lactating mother Russia poses a threat to every nation within its reach, including, first of all, the Russians themselves. Look at all those waves of Russian meat thrown into the grind of Bakhmut, for example. Again and again and again, hundreds of thousands of useless deaths. What for? Putin's outdated Soviet imperial ambitions only. So such yourself whether a state such as Russia poses a threat to Japan, New Zealand or Australia. And if you decide to ignore what is happening today in Ukraine and fall into this not our war mire, well then, mark my words, Russia will come to you at some point. And as soon as it does, dear subscriber, you then won't have to ask UATV to explain if Russia poses any threat. You will then find it out for yourself, which I sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, wish not to happen to you. It was Henry Keane on UATV Ukrainian State Channel hoping to explain enough of our truth in easy enough terms for you today. And I also strongly recommend watching an interview with Greta Uling, the author of the Daily War book. This is the investigation of the war against Ukraine since 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and part of Donbass. Also, please do not forget to subscribe and ask us any questions in comments below and we will do our best to answer it online. Thank you. Stay safe and tune for more already on Monday tomorrow. See you then.